Morning, church family. Oh, thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm reading Titus 3, 3 through 7, apparently. And uh, for we ourselves, we are also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hate, and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of our Savior, of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All right, I'll add to the good mornings. How be everybody? Feeling good? What a high Sabbath day, isn't it? Very high. We've had a baptism. We praise the Lord for that. We do have a, a deacon ordination, two deacons being ordained. So we're going to have two short messages, one of, with, uh, pertaining to deacons and then, to, um, you know, baptism. But the theme really is to take your stand. You know, have you taken your stand for Christ? And... Um, but uh, one other high point is we have a business meeting tonight. Amen? It's a high Sabbath day. So I do have a story of a young boy whose vision was restored. And I'm going to actually show a, uh, tell a story on that, and I have a short little video on that. So if that will entice you at all, we have pizza also. Maybe that will help. And ice, and ice cream. So many reasons to come tonight to keep the high day rolling. So... But uh, let's say a word, one more word of prayer to ask the Lord's blessing as we spend time in His Word. Lord, thank you again for this, this high, high Sabbath day. Every Sabbath day is great, but this just seems to be special. The sun is shining, and we know it's going to get warmer this next week, so it just feels good. And we seek your blessings, uh, continued blessings on this day, Father, that you would fill each of us with your Spirit, and that you would just be present, draw each one of us closer to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I've been uh, myself looking a lot into the Bible and the history in the Bible of all that. So it's just interesting in ancient times, maybe you're well aware that the scriptures were not so prevalent and available as they are today. They were very hard to come by. If you own a Bible today, you're actually among a tiny percentage of people that actually owned a copy of the scriptures. And, um, you know, for centuries what a Christian would have done for a copy of the Scriptures, or even just to have access to them, what they would have gone through. But we have it so easy. Usually we have multiple copies, and God forbid that they might collect dust on our shelves. Or if you have a Bible app that you haven't refreshed your app because you haven't looked at it long enough. Again, throughout history, people were longing to have access to the Scriptures. You know, there were a couple major barriers in the past, literacy was one. Not everybody was literate like they are today. We all have access, more access to education. That didn't happen back in the days. And, but then if you were literate, just the time and the expense to get a copy was so great. Uh, before the printing press and copiers, how did they make the Bible? By hand. You had scribes. They would make copies of the Bible, and they were distributed from there. Uh, and the process was long and tedious, so uh, even looking to some of the history as far as especially the Jewish scribes, the rules that they had to hang, to, to hold on to and to, um, to keep when they were copying the scriptures. It's, it's very interesting to see. And it took months of work to make a single copy of the scriptures, up to 10 months, one source said. So you can imagine the cost. They say it took a, an average person, it took one year's wage to have a copy of the scripture. So when's the last time you thank God that you have the full counsel, that you have his full counsel today? So easy, but then maybe it just makes us a little, uh, I don't know, lackadaisical possibly, because we have it so easy and they didn't. So they longed for the scriptures, but we can long for the scriptures as well. So for the most part, if people wanted to have access to the scriptures, they had to go to a church or go to some type of communal gathering in order to... Uh, hear the word read out loud, and there were readers, those who knew how to read, that they would read the scriptures 
out loud. And, uh, you know, the scriptures back in the days, uh, you know, just looking at a bit of ch church history, they were written in Latin, mainly in the Western portion of the church. They were written in Greek in the Eastern part of the church. So I'm not exactly sure how that worked if the people didn't speak Latin or Greek and they still wanted to have access because the Bible was not written in everybody's language. So interesting thing. But there's an account for in uh, May 303 of two deacons, we're talking about deacons here, that uh, they were arrested by the Roman Empire. And keep in mind, from 303 to 313, historically we know that there was an intense time of persecution under the Roman Emperor Diocletian. So it was right at the beginning of the time, and uh, you can really see it as Satan's seed, Satan working through his seed in order to squash out the church, or at least to get people to renounce their faith and to stop from following Christ. But here you have these two deacons who had been arrested. Right? They came before the court, and of course the magistrate wanted them to turn over the scriptures that they had, the copies of the scriptures that they had that, that were being read, and they said, hey, we're just deacons, right? We don't have a copy of the scriptures. The readers have the scriptures. So the magistrate will tell us who the readers are. And they said, well, we're not going to tell you. You know, we're not going to be traitors and turn our brothers in. So unwilling to yield to the demands of the authorities, they paid the ultimate price. And I don't know anything about, about these deacons. I haven't found anything about these deacons. Uh, they, maybe they were married. They could have had children, you know, but they were executed for not giving up the names of the readers, the, those who possessed the manuscripts of the Bible. Rather, they were willing to take a stand for the truth of God and for His cause at the ultimate expense. So that begs the question, do we have that same determination today to take a stand like that for Christ? Today we are ordaining two deacons who are no less important than those two deacons back in the days, Jim, Mika. It's an exciting day for you guys. You know, um, do you have that same determination as those two back then? You know, being a deacon is not just busy work, amen? It's just not work that other people won't do in the church. And so much more than that, the work of a deacon is absolutely necessary for the operation of the church. And I would say if any church office feels like busy work, then maybe it's not the job for you. Or maybe the issue is actually you, quite possibly. But as I have mentioned, the last time we had deacon ordination, the first time the office of deacon comes up in the Bible is in Acts chapter 6. And um, they were established, the office, doesn't say office of deacon, but the deacon was established to do some of the work in the church for what purpose? so that the apostles could go out and focus their time on preaching the word. But that doesn't mean that deacons did not or do not have the responsibility of spreading the word. Amen? In the very next chapter, Acts chapter 7, is the account of Stephen. If you remember about Stephen, given the, uh, the account of the gospel, he was filled with the Spirit, trying, trying to uh, convince, lead the Jews to accept Christ, and... Um, he was making his, his appeal, and he did such a great job that they put him to death. That's how great a job he did. So maybe when we leave Sabbath service after a sermon or we leave Bible study and uh, we're feeling good, maybe, maybe we're not doing our job, technically. You know you're doing a good job preaching the, tr the truth when people want to kill you when you're done, as it did with Stephen. He did that great of a job. So the office of deacon, again, is a necessary part of the church. And we have one verse to share. Paul's letter to Timothy, he spoke about deacons. And this text is, For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So just a, a cool text there. So Jim and Mika, you're being asked to serve at our local church. Amen? And are you willing, once again, to take a stand for Christ? Are you willing and to serve Him at all costs, from the small things around the church 
to the larger things. What does Christ say? He was faithful in the little things, is faithful in and much. And yeah, many of the things are small, but some things are bigger. Are you willing to sacrifice your time and your life for the gospel? Are you willing to do that? Then, according to that text, then know by doing so that you will be serving well, as Paul said, you can move forward knowing that you have a high standing in the courts of heaven, and you can move forward with great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I'd like to ask Jim and Mika to come forward here, and I'd also like the, to ask any deacons that would like to come forward or elders. We're going to have a prayer of ordination, essentially a prayer of blessing over these gentlemen here. So come on forward. We'll probably have you right up front here. We'll be fine. So come on forward. Right on. So ordination in the Seventh-day Adventist Church essentially is a recognition. It's a prayer of blessing and that the Lord will bless you and your service uh, for Him always, but then especially locally in our church. So I'm going to start off, uh, actually I'm going to open the floor to anybody who's willing to pray to say a short word, and then I will close. And if you are able to, let's place our hands on him, or we can do a chain, whatever works. So let us pray. Lord, thank you for uh, allowing me to come to participate in helping the church with its, its work and spread up your word. Uh, there's also a uh, good man who seems to try to, to live by your word and spread it as best I can. Amen. Father, I thank you for Jim and for Mika and their willingness to, to help the willingness to serve. I ask you to remind each of us every day to be faithful in the little things. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to first and foremost uh, praise you for all your love and your grace and your mercy upon us. We're here gathered to worship you first and foremost, and we're not lifting up any individual um, you know, beyond their position and standing in you. Father, we recognize you first, and I pray that you'd help all of us to take our stand for you in whatever office or whatever place we are in our lives, Father, that you would help us to take that stand and make decisions for you. We want to lift up Jim Case, Mika Habimana here uh, this morning, even afternoon now. Father, that your Holy Spirit would be with them. Father, continue the work that you've begun in them. And Father, give them the, the gifts that they need. Give them the willpower. Give them the strength, Father, to uh, work in your kingdom, to work in this local church. Yes, the small things, even to the greater things. Father, may you guide them and lead them, help them to be examples of the flock to all of us, Father, and may your blessings go before them and just continue to be with them. Father, may you bless the work of our hands as they work for your kingdom, Lord. We ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys stay right there. We have something for you. <clears throat> okay, right on. Yeah, very nice. Okay, we, of course, we have the uh, special certificates here. They're not frames, so we'll let you pick your own frames on that one there. Here's one for Mika. That's for you. One for Jim. I did put a verse right on the back. What verse did we put on the back there? It says here, uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 13. For those who have served well, uh, as well as, as well deacons, obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus in Christ Jesus. Amen. Very good. 
Thank you for your service. Thank you for being part of our church. Thank you. Appreciate okay? It. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Amen. We also wanted to give uh, Steve a little something for his baptism there. We're not going to make him get up. He's in the front row anyways. And since uh, I put it together, I'm a man is going to come in a brown bag. <laughs> I thought about a box, but I went one notch up from a box. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Claudia always makes fun of me because I put a lot of things in boxes. I mean, I love boxes, right? It separates things. And uh, she had a, one of her mental health counselor friends back in Nebraska there that she says, my husband did this, does the same thing. It's like they have brain damage or something. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I'm sorting. I'm compartmentalizing, you know, like that. You know, it just happens to be a nice cardboard box trimmed down. So very good. All right, just a, uh, a handful of thoughts here, you know, connecting more to baptism. But, you know, this applies to all of us, amen, as we talk about our commitment to the Lord in whatever office, whatever capacity we serve in the church, uh, baptism, what a witness this has been for us to... Hey, for those who have been baptized or are thinking about it, hey, it's a, it's a, in a way, it's a recommitment uh, for us. And then, as Rob mentioned, yeah, we're here to support Steve. We're here to support each other, amen? And then he's here to support us. That's how it works in a church as we work together as a body. So this applies to us all. How many of you have heard of the 40 Martyrs of Sebast? Anybody heard of that story before? All right, very nice. So history reminds us of, a, of the truly courageous story of these 40 martyrs of Sebast. Their story is first recorded in a sermon by Basil the Great in the 4th century. He was a bishop of Caesarea, and it was some 50 or 60 years after these uh, martyrs were put to death in the city of Sebast, which is in modern-day Turkey. Keep in mind, in 313, there was Roman Emperor Constantine, when he came to power, do you remember what, he, what edict he established and what he said through that edict about Christianity? Okay, now that Christianity became tolerated in 313. And he was more starting off in the west part of the Roman Empire, uh, but he also had a co-ruler, co Emperor Licinius. He continued more in the east, but he continued to persecute Christians. So a little context there. So it was in 320 when... The 12th Roman legion in Sebast was commanded to offer sacrifices as a test of their loyalty, and that's what they required from their soldiers back in those days. But these 40 Christian soldiers who were from Cappadocia, they refused, saying, we will not sacrifice, for to do so is to betray our faith. So wishing to preserve their soldiers, if they were this special elite group, of soldiers, Governor Agricola attempted to persuade them. He's like, think of the disgrace you're bringing upon your legion. But the men answered, to disgrace the name of our Lord Jesus is more terrible still. The governor continues, give up this stubborn folly. You have no Lord but Caesar. And I promise promotion to the first one of you who steps forward to do his duty. <coughs> But none of the soldiers moved. The governor then switched tactics, right? What does Satan do? He finds another way, right? He threatened them with torture, imprisonment, and death, and all of that if they continued to refuse. But the soldiers stood firm. They said, you can offer us nothing that would replace what we would lose in the life to come. We have learned to deny our bodies where our souls are at stake. So Governor Agricola had the stubborn soldiers flogged after that point, but not one surrendered. Then they were imprisoned until Lysias, he is the commander of the 12th Roman Legion. He arrived later, and then he once again demanded that his soldiers would submit to worship the emperor and offer sacrifices or else pay the ultimate penalty for their defiance. So the 40 respectfully refused. This was in the wintertime. Kind of like this, a little chilly outside, right? So Lysias then ordered that the soldiers be stripped and sent into a frozen lake until they either recanted or died of exposure. The 40 soldiers actually disrobed themselves and walked into the lake, marching in. The commander posted guards to prevent their escape. 
from the cold waters, the icy waters. He also arranged a fire and a warm bath on shore, tempting them to um, surrender, but encouraging each other. They stood firm. The Christian soldiers, of course, huddled together, praying, shivering. They, I think this is the song. It says, Lord, we are 40 engaged in this context. Grant that 40 may receive crowns of glory. And it wasn't too longer that actually one man submitted. He succumbed. He broke. So he left his companions. But his, um, as he entered the hot bath, the sudden heat was too great of a shock for his body. And you might recognize that in the wintertime when you have cold hands. You put it under warm water. So, and this guy actually ended up perishing through that. But that's when a guard named Aglius stepped forward, another Roman guard. He took off his uniform, confessed Christ, and joined the remaining 39 soldiers. Thus, the number of 40 remained complete. Amen. At daybreak, the frozen bodies of the 40 martyrs were burned. The charred bones and ashes were thrown into a river. A truly amazing account of 40 who were willing to take their stand for Christ. As it says in Revelation chapter 12, they did not love their lives even when faced with death. So again, do we have that same determination as these 40? You know, usually our lives, we're not, you know, threatened with death so much, are we, in the, in the time we live in, in the place we live in? But do we have that same determination as these guys had? How about Daniel and his friends? Do we have that as our mind determined, right, that we're going to remain faithful to God? Are you going to have the same determination as the disciples? All but one, of course. Are you willing to risk life and limb, literally, as these gentlemen did? So, Steve, praise God for your decision. And again, this is a public proclamation of a decision that you have been making for some time and then leading up to. So are you willing to take your stand? I imagine you're saying, yes, I see you nodding. So of course. So, but not only today, but going forward, you know, day after day, are you willing to take your stand when things become challenge, uh, challenging in your life? Because it's when the challenges come that we start to <laughs> question and we look back and, you know, sometimes even feel like we want to give up. And just as Satan is alive, challenges to our faith will come. That is one thing that we can count on. So a text that I read not too long ago here, and I think it applies very well to our, our, our day here today, but also Steve as a military person, and Jack, I think he might have had to leave, but I think maybe this will, you'll be able to connect with this all the more. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So a true soldier, what does a true soldier want to do? They want to obey, they want to follow the commands of their uh, uh, general, the commanding officer. Isn't that so? You know, so it is of the disciples of Christ. As good soldiers of Christ, we want to follow the same. We want to follow the commands of our Lord. And um, the one thing that really stands out in that text there, it says, no soldier in what type of service? Did you catch that? In active service. Right? In active means you are actively serving as a soldier for Christ. And those who are actively serving for Christ, it is much less likely that you will entangle yourself in the affairs of everyday life. As long as you are connected with your um, you know, training and all you do with the military now, if you are totally engaged with that, right, you are in that essence required to be engaged in that. So how much less likely right, in the, in the, in the um, army of Christ that we need to be fully committed to Christ. One more text, Ephesians chapter 6, 
This is a common text that we uh, read, but it, it fits well with the theme. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm. Again, taking your stand for Christ. It's only if you have the full armor of Christ that you can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against the flesh and the blood. It's not against each other, but against the rulers and powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, again, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to risk, uh, resist the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So there's no greater war than the one that you have entered into. And that applies to all of us. There is no greater war. And again, it's going to take a determined faith, a determination that can only come from God and submitting to Him in order to be able to stand firm. Because the devil's going to do whatever he can to get us entangled in the regular affairs of life. And yeah, we all have things that we are uh, involved with, but once we become entangled with them and then they take the place of our first, our service to God, then we start to run into problems. He's trying to draw us away from Christ. He wants to break up our families. He wants to break up our church. He wants us to disconnect from the local church. And uh, did not Christ establish the church, whether you see it as the, the overall arching worldwide church or right down to our local church? So we can expect these things. Amen? I mean, so be it. But there's hope. There's hope, and, and hope is often expressed in one simple word in the Bible, and it happens to be my favorite word in the Bible, and some of you youngins might know what that word is, so don't say anything, but I have a favorite word in the Bible. But first, I want to know, what is your favorite word in the Bible? Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah is a good word. What else? What's your favorite word in the Bible? You guys have one? I know you do. Not, I know everybody's not shy, but faith. faith is a good word. Hallelujah and faith. I heard uh, C. So we have our words, right? And some words may stand out more to you. But I want to tell you what my favorite word is. My favorite word is but. I'm not lying. But one important detail, it's but with just one T. <laughs> just with one T. I want to give you a couple of examples here. Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22. Here's with David. He was in a, in a time of anguish. Notice what he says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt that way before? Why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. So how's David feeling at this point? Not so good, right? He's crying out to the Lord, and it's like the Lord's not hearing. I don't feel you. I don't hear you. Here's David. Then my favorite word comes up. And what is that word? But. Or your translation, sometimes they say yet. Same idea, right? He says, but you are holy, O you who are throned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered, and you they trusted and were not disappointed. So David's hope, you can see, rested on that one little transitional word. Although David felt forsaken, was he forsaken? Was God not there? No, David ultimately had to put his faith that God was there, even though he wasn't feeling like God was there, and David was delivered uh, at many times on his walk. So you read through the rest of Psalm 22, you're going to come across a handful of other yets or buts, and you'll see that transition word there. Uh, it's actually a messianic prophecy, Psalm chapter 22. Was it not Jesus who, when he was on the cross? What did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? Maybe calling people's attention. He, some say he was actually singing the song, the psalm, trying to draw people back to Psalm 22. 
So in his moment of despair and separation, did not Christ go through that moment of separation from the Father? But why did he do it? Of course, he did it for you and I. It was not based on his own sin, but all along in the same way, did his Father ever leave him? No, not at all. But sin may have caused that separation, so it felt like he wasn't there. So in like manner, it's the same thing for you and I, amen? There may be times in our lives when we don't feel God, and we pray. It doesn't seem like our prayers are going anywhere, nowhere, no further than the ceiling itself. All right, Lord, I'm praying, but I don't feel anything. But can we believe that God is always there? According to his word, we can believe that he is always there and he's gracious and merciful. I have one more but. It's in our scripture reading, Titus chapter 3. It starts off in verse 3. Notice, Titus chapter 3. This is a cool book. How, many, how much time do we spend in the book of Titus? Not too much, but there's two cool... Uh, I mean, the whole book is good, of course, but there's two sections that, are, that really stand out. They're really salvation uh, statements, so you could say. We're going to read just the beginning of Titus chapter 3. Uh, starting in verse 3, it says, For we also were foolish ourselves, once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. And what's the word? But when the kindness of our God, of God our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. So that one word, what is the one word that stood between those two states? But was the word. It changes everything. It changes everything. Of course, who is the but of the story? That is Christ. That is God. That is the Lord himself. And although many of us partook in these, as it says at the beginning, we ourselves were disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures as we're seeking after our own, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Maybe in some ways we're still struggling with some of those things, to be honest, right? To be real, as they say. But each one of us have been given a but. But your unsanctified minds might be going to the wrong but. We're going to the but with just one T. I'm thinking about Christ, of course. And although we were or are dead in our trespass and sins, we have been given a way out, of course, and that is through Christ Jesus, who is the manifestation of God's grace and mercy. And although we don't deserve the gracious gift of eternal life because we've all fallen short, and we don't deserve not receiving what we do deserve because our God is merciful, amen? And that's where our word comes in. But when the kindness of our God of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Is He saying not to do righteous deeds? No, but He's saying that's not what saves you. He says He saved us according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom we pray for and ask for daily, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen? So I just love that text. There's another cool text in Titus chapter 2, but this was Titus 3, 3 through 7. So, um, yeah, check that text out. But uh, anyway, Steve. You've made the decision. You've been making the decision, as was emphasized, to follow Christ. Amen? Leading up to your baptism today, and all of us who have made the decision or are contemplating the decision or wrestling with it, you know, the call from Christ is to take our stand every day, every moment when we're challenged with things. We need to take our stand today just as the 40 martyrs of Sebast did and their ultimate uh, expression of their faith, even to death. And remember, Jesus is the one word who stands between life 
and death. He is always what comes in the middle between our former lives, our former habits, maybe even the habits we're wrestling now, the things that separate us from Christ. He stands in between, and He gives us a life eternal in Christ. And we can say amen and amen to that. So let us all take our stand, make that commitment. We have so many examples in the Bible. We have our brothers and sisters in the faith, although far from perfect, all of us, let's take our stand together. Amen? Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for, again, for this, this awesome day. We thank you for the, the commitment of, of Steve, his family, and, and all of us, Lord. And we know our commitments are, uh, yeah, a little shady sometimes and, um, and weak, and we flutter this way and that, Father. But I pray that you'd help each of us to take a stand for you, Lord, to follow through with the commitments. Lord, that you want us to make. Lord, put a heart in each of us to take a stand for you, no matter where we are in our lives, whether we're serving in the church, whether we're off working, wherever, Father, in our homes. Help us to take a stand for you uh, today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Lord, in the name of Jesus, amen.